Um, thank you everybody so much for joining us here today. Um, like I've been saying, if uh, you haven't already, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Let us know where you're calling in from. Let us know about your business, about your restaurant. Um, we, we love to hear from you. Um, we, we know that restaurants and cafes and bars and other small food and beverage companies have been among the hardest hit by this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so we wanted to recognize that and spend some time diving a little bit deeper within your industry with this webinar that we have. We've been producing um, almost, I think we had produced about 20 or so webinars last year. Um, and this is kind of the first one kind of diving deeper into the restaurant industry. And we hope that provided you all um, find value with this, um, we can continue with this in the future as well. Um, we're so excited to have one of our PCB advisors, Trevor Toe, joining us here today. Um, he's going to be talking through and sharing some strategies and approaches for building out a cost-effective menu um, and also minimizing our waste. Um, I, as I've been saying in our introduction here, we've built in some pauses throughout the presentation to, to answer questions. So if you do have any questions that pop up, feel free to ask them in the Q&A box um, and we will get um, to answering those during those breaks. Um, before we do get started, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce Pacific Community Ventures, if you're not um, familiar with us. We are a nonprofit that's dedicated to the support and success of small businesses across the country. Um, our mission is to invest in small businesses, create good jo jobs for working people, and make markets work for social good. Uh, we do this through our impact measurement research and consulting program, our fair and affordable lending program in the state of California, and our free business advising program across the, across the U.S. And if you aren't yet working with a free advisor through our businessadvising.org platform, um, I'll share details in the chat um, as well as in a follow-up email um, either later today or tomorrow with the details of how you can get started. Um, and we can connect you with an advisor such as Trevor to help you through some of um, the challenges and opportunities that you're facing in your business. All right, with that said, I will happily pass it over to Trevor. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah. So just really briefly about myself, uh, I've been in the hospitality industry since I was 16, uh, kept getting promoted, worked all through college um, and then after college, and then got married, decided the 50, 60 hour work week plus nights and weekends just <laughs> wasn't my thing. Um, and my wife was very happy when I kind of transition to a corporate setting. Uh, now I do uh, merchandising analytics for a um, very large company out here in, based in Birmingham. And a lot of what I do now is definitely uh, translatable into the restaurant industry. It's definitely helped take in, uh, me out of the details and has kind of expanded my view. You know, because we always talk about, you know, you got to expand your view, look at the bigger picture. And um, my career transition has definitely helped with that. So next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Morgan. All right. So kind of diving into what this will be and what it won't be, uh, because I know everybody's time is money, right? Especially when you're uh, in a restaurant and <laughs> you've only got an hour. So this presentation will definitely cover profitability. We're gonna go over your waste, which is a lot of processes and procedures. We're gonna be talking about forecasting. We're gonna be talking about par sheets. Um, and then we're gonna be diving more into your menu offerings. We're gonna be talking about calculations uh, in order to be able to you know, really analyze your menu offering. Like, are you maximizing your profitability inside of what you're offering? And then we're gonna be taking a step back, looking at you know, how else besides pricing can I, you know, affect my profitability, which is, you know, sourcing and then finally tying it all together and pricing. Uh, what we won't really cover is menu display. I know that there's an entire science behind it. There's a lot of resources out there. Um, some are fairly reasonably priced. Um, some, you know, website platforms that allow you to seamlessly transition all of your menus between your Uber Eats, your Grubhub, and then your um, website menu to where you can upload a PDF format of that. And then I'm also not gonna be telling you, you know, how to create items. I'm not gonna be telling you what ingredients to put in your dish, 
However, we will be covering, you know, calculations in order to be able to realize, am I portioning my, you know, dishes correctly? Am I, do I really need to add this ingredient? Because perhaps that's where you're losing some of that profitability. We'll be covering that in just a minute. So if you want to go ahead and move on. So before we really dive into everything, I definitely just want to kind of take a step back and think about, you know, supply and demand and with the changes that you make after this presentation or at any point, you know, with COVID affecting everybody in different ways, thinking about your consumers and whether or not your consumer base has evolved or changed since the beginning of the pandemic, right? Because you don't really get that walk in with everybody now. You can't really see your customer face to face as much. So my question is, is, is everybody's consumer base the same as pre-pandemic? You might have attracted some new customers. You might have grown younger. You might have grown older. You um, might be getting some people who have some different palettes, right? Dive into your menu when you're done after, you know, this presentation really start to see, you know, your trends. Has anything changed since um, COVID as far as, you know, what people are ordering? Why are they ordering that? Things of that nature. And then obviously always, you know, the changes to your back house and front house. Any time you do anything, you should always be really thinking about, you know, how is this going to affect my guys on the front of house execution wise and back of house execution wise? Because when you're thinking about, you know, reducing a menu or adding a menu item, it's going to affect your back of house in some way, shape or form. And, and it might provide opportunity to maybe speed it up. You know, as you're reducing dishes, as you're reducing ingredients, you might be able to speed up that back of house because all of a sudden you've got um, space available for, you know, double pans of a lettuce if you're a sandwich shop, you know, things that could ultimately help you with your efficiencies. And so just kind of going into it with that mind frame or that set of uh, mind, really thinking about, you know, your consumer and how these changes might trickle down and affect, you know, every part of your business. Ready for the next slide if you are. All right, so we're going to be diving into waste. Waste, um, whether that's, you know, going in the trash after it's been bought from the consumer or if it's in, going in the trash from, you know, failure of FIFO, you know, it's just gone bad. National average is somewhere around 4 to 10%. And a lot of times, you know, the reasons for waste is failure of FIFO. You know, are we... <laughs> taking care of that low hanging fruit of, you know, making sure that we're utilizing every little stitch that we have in our back of house. On top of that, it's overbuying is oftentimes a reason for, you know, waste. And some things that we can do to combat that is obviously tracking your inventory and then par sheets, par sheets for your ingredients and then par sheets for your production. Also, um, you know, the over-preparing, if you're not using, utilizing par sheets for your, you know, like coleslaw or anything of that nature, you might be losing money there too. And then obviously quality control. So if you're thinking about it in terms of, you know, processes, if you have someone new who's maybe accepting cases on your shipments that they probably shouldn't be accepting, you know, like they're not checking that bottom layer for, you know, bad product, you might be losing more um, product than what you realize. And then obviously with the meal production, it's, are they portioning out correctly? Do you, has everyone been trained in the back of the house to know what portions um, go on each meal? So we're, we're going to be diving into that a little bit more too. If you want to hit the next slide, Morgan. Thanks. All right. So really diving into buying, you know, what all goes into that. It's forecasting. 
And there's quite a few ways that you can look at forecasting. You can look at it just simply last year on this week, I did X amount, or you can get as complicated as you want. Meaning, you know, you can do a weighted forecast where it's last year is only worth 80% of um, what you're looking at. And then the three years past that are 30%. So it's a weighted um, average in order for you to really be able to take a look and see, you know, if previous years aren't weighted as heavy, you can have a really good average. <clears throat> Pardon me. Another thing that really goes into forecasting is weather. So, you know, is your business declining 20% during rain? Conversely, are there any, you know, items that you might not be thinking about? You know, are you really tracking those days where there's some type of difference? Where your, you know, menu might be, you know, fluctuating in certain areas or not. And then obviously events. And then underbuying. You know, are you having to run to the grocery store a lot? Are you having to go to Restaurant Depot and you're paying a 10 to 20% premium on some of those products because you're not forecasting correctly? Also, you know, in order to be able to, you know, help with the underbuying, you know, really be able to see when you're running into issues Par sheets are a really great way for you to be able to, you know, effectively analyze your business. And so we're going to be d diving into a couple of examples here. So this first par sheet is more of a um, production par sheet, right? So you have your product, product name, your unit measurement. So however you want to break that down, whether it be pound or ounce, you know, and then the unit price per that pound or ounce, and then what you want to build up to. So your forecasting is really where this is key, right? Accurate forecasting allows you to be able to really affect your par sheets because it should be changing every week because your forecasting should be only going out a week and it should be pretty accurate within 10%. So when you're utilizing the par sheet, you're kind of working backwards. So your forecasting says, we're gonna be looking at, um, you know, $20,000 worth of sales. On average, I sell X dish, you know, is, you know, 20% of my sales normally during this time of the month. And then you can take a look and say, all right, so my production needs to be X amount if I'm gonna be selling, you know, let's say $2,000 worth of coleslaw. You can price it out, all right, so I've got five ounces of coleslaw per unit. And the $2,000 ends up being, you know, somewhere around uh, 90 units, we'll say. So you can then say, all right, so 90 times six. Right, so that's 360 ounces, boom. So that's that's what you need for that week on the production. So if you wanna break it down even further, you can, you can do it by day, but you're gonna to have to be forecasting by day because the averages aren't gonna work when you're doing it that way, just simply because you're not really taking into account your emergency or your over and under. So typically, yeah, it really depends on how your kitchen is set up because if you don't have the space, you can't really just do production two, two times a week, right? Because you've got a small back of the house, you're limited. So you really need to be doing production day by day, um, which is hard, but it's doable if you have a really solid forecasting. Now there are tools out there. Uh, there's a lot of POS systems that allow you to forecast, or if you're like me and you wanna do it in Excel, which after this, we can probably uh, do an Excel file for this, for forecasting and for par sheets. Um, you know, doing it by day can be tedious. It can be hard, but it's definitely worth it when you're thinking about it in terms of, you know, not 
wasting anything out of your kitchen. Because when you're having these processes, procedures set up, you're not throwing anything in the trash, which is going to end up, you know, getting you to that ultimate goal of somewhere around 10% profit that we all are kind of, you know, <laughs> seems like that unicorn that we all chase, but never can quite get. So definitely I can't understate the importance or overstate enough the importance of partials and the utilization of it and the forecasting that goes into it. So if we want to hit the next slide, this is the second part sheet now. So now that we have kind of taken a look, we know, you know, all right, we need 360 units of coleslaw. What does that break down to on the food items, right? So what do I got in there? I've got cabbage, I've got carrots, I've got, you know, a little bit of apple cider vinegar, mayonnaise. So you've got a part sheet for your buying. That's all right there. You're gonna then work backwards, right? So, all right, I know inside my coleslaw at, you know, I can make 20 pounds of coleslaw with, you know, let's say 20 carrots, right? So that's, you just break it down that way. So that's your par level per se. You subtract out your amount in store. You add in maybe 10% for emergency, you know, so that you're not having to run to the restaurant depot, so that you're not having to run to, you know, uh, Kroger's. And then plus, you know, whatever events might be happening around you, whether that be, you know, a concert or a soccer, local soccer game going on, just really try to be involved with your community and really try to understand, you know, when are people coming in? What does my foot traffic look like? Or what does my online foot traffic look like? Um, and that should get you the order amount that you need. And so that's how, as far as with processes and procedures, you can start to eliminate waste. Because all of a sudden, if you're working backwards, you're only keeping in stock what you need. Your FIFO should not be an issue anymore because your overcrowding situation should start to go down. You should also start to see a little bit of money start to free up, right? Because you're not having as much sitting inventory, which we're going to be covering in just a minute. On top of that, you know, it, it's not like that money goes away. That money just all of a sudden becomes free and usable for other things, like maybe payroll or maybe the slicer that broke down. You know what? You know, um, obviously it's it's a fine balance because you don't want to under inventory yourself because then you're losing money, but you also don't want to over inventory yourself because you're also losing money. So again, forecast to lead to the production part sheet. From the production part sheet, you should be getting your item part sheet for your buy. And that should be done weekly, if not bi-weekly. So whoever you have doing that really needs to be one or two people and they need to be good at it. So whether that, if you want to take that on or your manager takes that on, or maybe even that's something that you do for a ship lead. So if we want to move into the next slide, that's definitely kind of where we're going. All right, so the par level, right? So sitting inventory, which is the full amount of money that you have sitting in your inventory, in your house, sorry, your back of the house, that's either dollar amount or unit amount. You can pick whatever you want. Depletion is obviously the amount that you're using or, you know, putting into your dishes over a certain period. The usage is the sitting divided by depletion. So let's say you have four gallons of milk, you use one per week, that's four weeks worth of supply. You can start figuring out pretty quickly with just simply that if you're overstocked. If you've got four weeks of supply of anything, or even three weeks supply of anything. Maybe it's time to talk to your supplier, right? Or um, some you're trying to figure out a special. I understand that there's certain items that you can't really do that on. So if we're talking, you know, the 50 gallon drum of uh, olive oil, <laughs> that's not going anywhere. Or the fish sauce, fish sauce, that's not going anywhere either, right? But it's uh, Primarily about those, just, 
you know, the spoilage. Those that have spoilage really understand where your usage is, how long of a shelf life you've got on that, and make sure that your, you know, back house manager really understands that too. Moving into variance, it's the ideal depletion, so versus your actual depletion, right? So your POS is telling you, hey, you should have only sold 100 burgers. Well, <laughs> you look at the inventory in the back of house, and you're seeing that you're out 120 burgers. What happened? You know, those are the things that you're going to be able to, you know, utilize in order to be able to catch faults in your process and procedures, or maybe even theft, or just, you know, spoilage, or somebody dropped a pan of it and just didn't tell you, right? So it's all about being able to catch things and then be able to react to them, right? So if you wanna go ahead and move to the next slide. All right, so here is an example of how you calculate waste. So let's say we're looking at a 40 pound case of romaine and it costs $40, right? Well, romaine is one of those that has a high waste percent, right? Because it's got the stem, Realistically, you're probably not going to use the core. The outermost layer of leaves aren't edible. So you're probably looking at about 70% of the case is actually usable. So by the time you get done trimming it, you're down to 28 pounds of usable romaine. That one pound is now costing you $1.42 instead of the $1, right? So Let's take it a further step. I know two cups per salad is a little bit much, but you know, for this example, the math was pretty clean. <laughs> so let's say you're averaging two salads trash per shift, right? So a bug got in it, hair, um, theft, um, employee meal, whatever. So out of those 12 salads, like, right, so over three days, 12 cups due to, you know, two chefs, we're down to 22 pounds. So that single 40 pound of romaine, sorry, the 40 pound case of romaine is costing you $1.81 per pound, not one. So I feel like that's not stated enough in a lot of reasoning, especially when you're talking about the 30, 30, 10, 30, 30, 30, 30, 10. <laughs> idea where it's, you know, your food cost percentage is 30%. Are you adding in that waste in order to be able to account for, you know, your total COGS? It's just a thought. I'm sure a lot of you are already doing that, but it's, it's really kind of novel and it really might be somewhere where, you know, you're not really thinking about it. Also, not every item is really going to have that high waste. You know, so rice, for example, right? You should be wasting zero, you know? However, you should be building in a little bit of a buffer, right? Just like in the park, you're building out, you know, emergency, you're building out for this, you know, um, expected waste. And everybody is gonna have a different tolerance of that, right? Because it's, it's your risk, essentially. So you can't, overstate it and you can't understate it. So typically, you know, if you work backwards, you know your restaurant best, you know, you know, if your guys are well-trained, um, whether or not you have high turnover, start playing with that number as far as your waste for each item and add that to your cost. So, and that's going to take a bigger role in some of the upcoming um, slides. So if you wouldn't mind hitting the next one, Morgan. All right, so tracking inventory, right? So always track with the PAR sheets, with the buying sheets, and especially the receipts off of everything that you get. So all the incoming product, make sure that we're tracking all the sales of those products, and then doing a weekly inventory. So at the end of each week, you should be inventorying your entire restaurant. So if you start pricing out at the ideal cost for all your items, you should be able to do that pretty quickly with a, you know, 
if you get one of those industrial scales, get maybe a little cart, your manager goes around and weighs it, you should be able to figure out, you know, all right, I sold, you know, uh, 2,000 pounds worth of this product. It weighs out, you know, per pound on retail this amount. I should have X amount left over. By doing the weekly inventory, you should be able to catch more um, issues if you do have any, or again, theft, shrink, whatever. And then also you should be able to know the average use of product in each dish, right? So that's kind of where a lot of people don't like <laughs> doing weekly inventory because you have to put in the work up front, know how much of you know carrots are going into each dish how much of you know protein is going into each batch of you know ground beef making sure that they're all the same because otherwise you're not going to be able to accurately inventory and that's going to be a big deal for you and your manager because if you're holding your manager's feet to the fire about this you've got to make sure that it's accurate or he's got to make sure it's accurate because then you can hold him accountable or them accountable for, you know, shrinkage or anything that's going wrong in the kitchen. If you wouldn't mind hitting the next one. All right, so we're on to common metrics. So we're really starting to get into the meat and bones of it. So starting out with the COGS, cost of goods sold, Cox is your beginning inventory plus your purchased inventory. So, you know, your grocery runs or anything extra minus your ending inventory, right? Your prime cost, which is your Cox plus your labor. And then your average inventory, which is beginning inventory plus ending divided by two. Here's why it's important is because that affects your inventory, sorry, inventory turnover rate. Your turn is pretty much telling you how often you're dollar-wise depleting your back of house. So it's not necessarily that you're depleting all your units, it's that dollar-wise, how often are you completely depleting your back of house? And I think a good example of this is, um, I'm gonna go the fast food route just simply because the numbers are public. So McDonald's, for example, uh, has a inventory turnover rate of 90, right? So basically what's happening is, is every three and a half days, dollar wise, McDonald's is completely turning or completely uh, wiping out their inventory in their back of house, which means that their sitting inventory is, you know, as minimal as it can get versus Wendy's who has a 40 turn. Wendy's takes nine and a half days to completely empty out dollar wise their back of house. The reason that's significant is, is because Wendy's then has to have double the amount of inventory in the back of house to do less sales. So with that money, what, what can McDonald's do, right? All of a sudden, they've got free capital to pursue higher labor. They can put that in, assuming that they continue to turn at that rate and that their processes and procedures and their forecasting and their par sheets are continuously accurate. They're able to reinvest that money into other things like labor, your bottom line profit, or, you know, reinvesting back into the restaurant, right? Maybe that's how you're able to, um, get the flat screen TVs up on your walls. Maybe that's how you're able to replace your hood. You know, though it will free up more money if you do have that slow turn and you start working at the processes and procedures and get that turn at a higher rate, it will allow you to utilize dollars that are already there. And that's really kind of a key component in total profitability, right? Is making sure that we're buttoned up, we're clean, and that we and our management and our you know, staff as a whole understand the end goal, which is we, we are a, <laughs> um, I like to call it a well-oiled machine because you have to be that way in order for this to work day in and day out 
because if you're investing that money, let's say you're getting that high turn and then all of a sudden you start slowing, you, you're going to be eating more money than you were previously, right? Because those dollars are just being repurposed. You're not making new dollars, right? And so that's really where, you know, some people can get in trouble. So I just a tale of caution, but also a great tale of opportunity if you're able to execute correctly. All right, I think we're on to the next slide. All right, so the recap, right? So basically what we started with was waste, you know, process and procedures. How are we taking in our inventory? Uh, do our guys know how to, you know, properly clean the romaine and not, you know, uh, increase our waste in certain items? Do my managers know how to forecast or are forecasting correctly? Because that leads into our par sheets which then leads into our buying, which then leads into, you know, our execution of uh, FIFO and other things that could potentially impact our waistline. And then finally, you know, all that kind of sums into, you know, our cost of goods and then our turn. Because ultimately it's about how productive the dollars that we have in the back of the house are. So that's, that's kind of the recap of the first half of it. Um, that's definitely some meat and potatoes. Taking a quick second to take questions. Thank you, Trevor. Um, anyone who's listening in, feel free to drop a question in either the chat box or the Q&A box, um, and we'll, we'll get those questions answered. We did have one question that came in asking about um, sharing out um, the Excel sh example that you had for the PAR sheet, that first example that you had. Um, so I will share out after this, um, either later today or tomorrow, I'll follow up with the recording from today, the slides from today, and that um, Excel sheet as well. Um, let's see, we do have another question that came in asking if this model applies for the food truck businesses um, or how you would modify, um, how would you need to modify for that? Right, so food truck, I understand is a little bit different. I've never managed a food truck. Um, I've never been a part of that. However, your waste will definitely be the same because it's going to break down into, because you want your cost of goods being somewhere around 30%. And it doesn't matter where you are or, you know, what type of business you are, you're going to want 30% on your cogs. So if I can see your forecasting and your ultimate, you know, turn probably being a little bit slower, and that's okay, so long as your cogs are still somewhere around 30 because it, I know that we're dealing with a lot of different restaurants and not everybody can, you know, hit, you know, a turn of, you know, ba basically three, you know, because that's, uh, that's very quick. So if you are instead, yeah, on the food truck side, you know, if your turn's slower, but your cogs are somewhere around 30%, you're going to be just fine. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, we had another question that came in saying, how do you coach an old school chef that goes by heart into recipe breakdown? <laughs> <laughs> you, you can definitely get an average. Um, if, if your chef is definitely, you know, old school goes by heart, you know, goes by taste. It just ask them to, you know, get you some measurements off of the times that he's doing it, maybe having them go over it, you know, for a week or two, getting you, you know, those measurements, and then you can just build an average. If, if you're okay with that, then, you know, go for it. And then, you know, that way you should still be able to tell when something is going awry. I hope that helps. Um, I think you talked about 
Any other questions? We'll have another break for, for questions at the end of the session as well. Um, so feel free to um, throw them in the chat throughout the presentation. But I think um, I think that's good for right now. We can we can move along. All right. All right. So we're going to be diving into menu offerings. We're going to be talking about how to calculate uh, menu profitability and then strategies um, in order to help profitability. And then we're going to be talking about that uh, fame 30, 30, 30, 10. If you wouldn't mind, next slide. All right. So calculations, right? Average cost of the dish is total cost of the carton divided by, you know, the usable percentage minus shrink percentage divided by the unit of whatever it is that's going into um, on average. So if you want to break it down by ounce, by pound, by half pound, whatever you want to do um, to make it easier for you to calculate, do it. And then average cost of the dish is the sum of the average cost of the ingredients which then goes into your food cost percentage, right? So average cost of the dish divided by the retail price. If you're a new store or a new restaurant, yeah, you know, we're gonna be talking about this, but basically you're gonna want the food cost percentage to be somewhere around 30%, right? So the food, I know I went a little fast on this, so let's kind of break it down a little bit further. So the average cost of the dish is, you know, that's where I was talking about with the previous question. If you just want to average out what he's using or to get that taste, that's okay because that's pretty much what it's going to boil down to here with the average cost of the ingredient. So the average cost of the ingredient is that unit where we're adding in that waste, right? because the average cost of the ingredient is not, you know, like we saw in the romaine, one, one dollar per pound, right? Which then if we broke it down by ounces, it, it'd be pretty small. And as far as labor costs, we're gonna be coming into that too, but um, typically it's, you're gonna want somewhere around 30% on the labor cost. But really talking about the average, food cost dish, you're also wanting ideally somewhere around 30% because that's going to translate into your COGS being somewhere around 30% as well. If you wouldn't mind, next slide. All right. So how do we figure out where to even start with the menu, right? So we've talked about the food costs and average ingredient cost and all the prices. Now, how do we figure out which dishes are even profitable, right? So if you're new, I would definitely start with five. I would figure out what five dishes are your bread and butter, are your core value, or your true, you know, what makes you you. I would then list out all ingredients, and then I would try to flesh out a menu with the ingredients that you have on hand. I would get as creative as you possibly can. And the picture of the ribbon salad, the reason that I had that up there earlier is because it's something where, you know, you're taking ingredients that you currently have and just, you know, a little bit of extra labor and you can totally repurpose them, right? Because it's, you know, zucchini and squash on mandolin, just slicing away with cherry tomatoes and cauliflower with a great vinaigrette dressing, right? It's all ingredients that you would probably have in your back of house already that you can use to offset some of your, you know, uh, higher priced items. So some of your protein, right? So that's kind of the strategy behind the five dishes. If you want to, you can definitely add maybe 10, 15% extra on the uh, ingredients in order to be able to uh, make brand new items, right? So let's say you're carrying chicken for, you know, grilled chicken sandwich. Well, if you add buttermilk flour and a couple of spices, all of a sudden you can offer tenders, fried chicken sandwich, you know, and if you had onions, you could do onion rings now too. So it's thinking about 
how to utilize the most out of as little inventory or as little, um, you know, unique SKUs as you can. Now, if you're an existing um, place and you've already kind of got everybody's taste buds set to a certain thing, what you can do is, is you can go with, you know, your high guys, your winners. So your high profitability, high sales, and then your okay units, which is your profit, profitable skew, your profitable dishes, but they're not that high of sellers, which, you know, you gotta be careful on the, the okay ones because they can very quickly bleed into the losers. So you really need to be checking to make sure that you're keeping enough sales on those items to be able to justify having them. And then there's the obvious losers where you're not profitable, you're not making you any sales whatsoever. And then finally, kind of your tried and true, you know, this is typically drinks, you know, not high profit, but very high sales. And you need a good mix between the winners and the old faithful to balance out the okay. The reason for that is, is because the okay is typically why, you know, you're getting a little bit of additional people. Um, you know, if a group is coming in, it's the one guy who's coming there for that one specific dish that nobody knows why he's coming in there for, you know, and you don't want to alienate those people because one person out of a group can ruin the entire mood and take their business somewhere else. So those okays, you definitely need to be keeping an eye on them. Those are definitely the ones that you should be, you know, thinking about axing or maybe even making seasonal. So when I'm saying high profit, high sales, I'm definitely talking about averages. So for the winners, are they above your um, average profit? Are they above your um, average sales in units? So it's pretty easy to take a look at this if you have a POS system. If you don't, make sure you're tracking sales because this is the only way that you're truly going to know um, what your customer is telling you. What, you know, because they vote with their wallet. And make sure, you know, there's a really great example, I think, of, you know, 86ing or axing too much, right? So I think it was Walmart back in the 80s. They had a brand new, C not 80s, 90s, brand new CEO come in and be like, you know, we're only selling, we're making a profit on these, you know, the top 20%. You know, top 20% is making almost 80% of our money. Why do we need these other things? So they started axing, you know, uh, a lot of SKUs. Well, what was happening was, they were losing money because a lot of people were coming to them for their variety. They were cut, you know, the, even though everybody was buying certain items, everybody was also buying a little bit of something else, you know? And so going back to the first slide, really thinking about your customer base and really being in tune with your customers before you make any of these decisions, because sometimes, you know, you might be doing more damage than good to your bottom line if you ask some of those okays. All right, so <laughs> I think we've kind of covered that enough. Um, so leading on from strategy, uh, going into our final kind of um, before we talk about pricing and kind of, you know, the last bit of this, it's sourcing. So sourcing has a very special place. It's kind of tied to everything, but it's kind of outside of everything, right? So it's definitely tied to your profitability and it's definitely something that we're all very interested in, but it's kind of hard to place it, you know, in with somewhere. So it's, if, you know, you've got your processes and procedures nailed down and then you've got your, you know, you've, you feel very confident about your average price. It is what it is. It can't get any lower by you just doing anything in-house. Try taking a look at sourcing. You know, start shopping around with other vendors 
Um, there's um, there are some um, websites that allow you to, you know, really take a look at other vendors and see what they have to offer for certain items. You know, maybe you don't get it all from one place or maybe you go from five different vendors to one vendor because they'll cut you an additional 5% discount. You know, just always be looking for something that is comparable to what you have that might be a little bit cheaper. Now to say that, you know, you might still be able to constantly get something a little bit cheaper that's just as good with your current vendor. And that is incredibly important because that's going to allow you to reduce that food cost percentage. And once you've already set your menu, if you can find something comparable that's cheaper and you can still sell it at that same rate, you're making just that much more money. So to move on from, you know, the, the big guys talking about the local sourcing, it's, it is great for advertising. It's great for, um, you know, just overall community, um, presence. However, when you're talking about local sourcing, you should be going into it with some expectations of, you know, higher waste. You should be going into it with expectations of consistency. Um, they might not be as consistent as the big guys, just simply because they don't have the capital and resources like the big guys. And you should be expecting, you know, your prices to increase. Along with, you know, the local guys, especially farmers, it's seasonal, right? They can't provide you all year round. So if you're comfortable with making, you know, if you have a concept that really allows you to, you know, make a seasonal menu that's maybe, you know, 15, 20% higher than the rest of your menu, and you can make that work and you see those sales, go for it, you know, because that it is a great advertising. It's a great community feel. Um, it's definitely something that everybody is talking about. And it's definitely something that's sustainable, right? Because if you're talking about just seasonal, so you're staying, you know, you're keeping up with the farmer, you're keeping up with, you know, his good crops, basically, you know, it shouldn't be an issue to have a higher price at that point. But this doesn't work for every concept, you know? So keep it in mind, keep in mind your um, customer base. You know, they might appreciate it, but whether or not they're willing to pay for it is a totally different um, ball game. All right, so if we wanna move into the last slide. All right, pricing, what we're all here for, right? So now that we've covered food cost, we can move into, you know, that food cost should be 30%. It's 30% of your food cost percentage. It should be your cost. So for the example, it's $3.99, divide that by 0.3, and it gives us $13.50. I understand that the cost is pretty high there. That should be some type of protein. So maybe, you know, some type of gourmet burger. So at $13.50, that should get us at that food cost percentage where it's just profitable, right? That's the 10% profit because if I've got my labor uh, in check and it's 30% of the sales and then my fixed cost are 30% of my sales, I, I make, I'm clearing, you know, $1.30, which is about as much as you can ask for. Now, keep in mind, not everything has to be 30. Your entire menu just needs to average out to 30. And let me take it a step further. It doesn't just need to be your average menu. It should be your forecasted sales that should average out at that 30 because not everything sells at the same rate on your menu, right? So you really need to take a look at those low profit. Remember those, um, you know, the old faithfuls that I had earlier, those need to be balanced out with those high profits. If you have too many, of the old faithfuls, you're not gonna hit, you know, your your profitability t 
to a certain extent, you might hit your sales goals. However, you know, you, you need to be able to have some type of balance. So, and that's definitely where the vegetarian options go. And, you know, that's how you balance out. Sorry, let me back up. <laughs> the vegetarian options are how you balance out your protein options, right? Because the vegetarian options are typically a little bit lower because they're cheaper. So keep that in mind, make sure that, and that's another reason why you should be looking every year at changing out your menu as well. Because sometimes the average or your sales average on that food cost might be dipping one way or the other. And so just making sure that you're able to fine tune and keep up with your menu is incredibly important. Next slide, if you don't mind. All right, so breaking down the 30, 30, 30, 10. So 30% of your total cost should be COGS, 30% should be labor, which is that prime number that we were talking about. And then 30% should be fixed costs. Taxes are in that, which leaves you 10% profit. So going over the first example, you know, let's say you're grossing a million dollars Cogs is 30, labor is 30, fixed cost is 30, you're making 100,000, congrats. In example two, so year two, you cleared 1.3 million, right? So your Cogs is somewhere around, you know, 30%, labor is somewhere around 30%, but your fixed cost stayed the same. All of a sudden you've made, you've almost doubled your money, right? And that's only $30,000 more. As the times have changed, so has the 30, 30, 30, 10, right? So no longer, you know, is that 30 really sustainable? Because you got to start paying people more, especially as, you know, wage, wages increase, you're going to have to start figuring out ways in order to be able to reduce the fixed cost or you're taking a little bit less on the profit side and increasing your total sales, right? Because something that we didn't cover was if you dip below 28% on your COGS, you're probably cutting corners and you're eventually going to start losing sales. So you can't nest 28 is an arbitrary number. You can probably get it to 28, maybe 27%. However, Below that, you're going to be running out of stuff. Your turn's going to be too high. All of a sudden, you know, people are going to stop coming because you never have what they want. So keep in mind, the labor is probably going to be going up and you need to be able to play with, you know, some of the things that used to be pretty standard. So fixed costs might be um, your rent. Fixed costs might be depreciation. Fixed costs are, you know, taxes. Um, fixed costs are your water, your electricity, things of that nature. Um, the biggest thing that you could probably help with on the fixed cost side is if you do find opportunity to repurpose dollars, help with the depreciation, right? Um, help yourself with rent. Always be looking to, you know, discuss with your landlord and always kind of be prepared because out here there have been a lot of stories you know about unfortunately landlords increasing rent exorbitantly because somebody is make, doing really well just always make sure that you're keeping in the back of your mind you know you got to be able to keep your fixed costs down and always be looking for opportunities in order to reduce it because you can't cut corners on your labor and you can't cut corners on your cogs. So just always keep that in mind. And in fixed cost, I would even say, you know, um, you're factoring in, um, well, I lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, how do you calculate the amount of time that goes into preparing a single item? Cool. Like meat sauce, great question. Uh, your prep time is going to be, it, it's just separate. So basically what you're going to have to do is, is 
take a look. You've just got to stay within the 30% of your sales. And unfortunately, it's different for everybody. There's a certain sales amount that allows your business to run incredibly smoothly. If you don't hit that sales, your labor is obviously going to exorbitantly outpace your sales. In that case, I would strongly suggest you take a look at the menu profitability. Where is it, you know, do you need it, unfortunately? Or is there something that you can do to reduce the prep time? Is there some, is this something that your manager's just gonna have to take over for a while because that labor needs to be redistributed somewhere else? You know, um, does the manager need to take over prep? And then the shift lead is taking over for uh, your, uh, you know, your uh, shift. Do you need to be taking over the shift while your manager is prepping? So it, there's ways to do it when you're looking at it in a percentage wise. However, you know, sales cures all. <laughs> I know that doesn't help um, per se, but if you do have your menu priced correctly, uh, you should be able to expect, you know, certain sales. And especially if you're reducing your pricing, you should see, you know, some type of sales increases. However, you know, you can always play with those percentages to be able to average out on the profitability side. All right, Morgan, next. All right, so the recap. So just to kind of fly through everything, waste, buying, forecasting, and turn all go into inventory costs. Your inventory costs go into your dish costs which then go into your food cost percentage, right? Which then turns into your COGS. Your COGS then turn into your prime and your pricing, right? And then that turns into the 30, 30, 30, 10, which then translates into your profit. And then some of the ways that you can really take a look at this is, you know, to increase your profit is sourcing, which is kind of like that outlier and something that you should always be looking to, you know, um, change up or, you know, find good deals, or if, you know, you're invested with a certain source, you know, really develop that and see if he can help you out. All right, guys. So that's really kind of all I have for the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Any questions? Thank you so much, Trevor, um, for, for joining us there. Um, and sharing all this, all your um, expertise and experience. Um, we'll pause for questions. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, I know we're right here at time, but we can um, answer a few questions if you have them. Um, one question that I had, um, you had mentioned that, you know, start with five when you're building up your um, your menu, start with those five key items. Um, you mentioned that was good for like newer restaurants. Have you seen restaurants use that to kind of adapt in the COVID world um, to adapt a, an abbreviated menu? Good question. Right. So especially if you're thinking about uh, you're losing people, you're um, losing your clientele, basically, right? Because your sales have dropped off almost 70%. So a lot of those SKUs can't be supported anymore. So this might be a really great time to kind of take a look at, you know, what makes you you. If you're only thinking about, you know, your online presence, uh, pick out those five that really represent you or your five best sellers or your high profitable SKUs, and then maybe just use that as an online presence. If you can't sustain, especially with the labor, anything on, you know, anything extra. Um, we had another question come in asking, what do you think about QuickBooks online inventory? I'm not familiar with QuickBooks. Um, I have, I'm a little bit more familiar with Toast. Uh, which, if I'm being honest, a lot of them use a lot of the same stuff. So if you are wanting to do something like that, absolutely go for it. 
Um, any type of tracking that you can do is always great than no tracking. Just make sure that uh, if it doesn't meet all the needs of your business, that you're looking for maybe something else or doing something additional in order to be able to really make sure that you're keeping up with your inventory. And especially, um, I know that a lot of other, I'm not familiar with QuickBooks, obviously, but I do know that a lot of those POS systems of today um, pair well with other, you know, outside sources. Like, um, I think it's seven, seven tickets, seven chan something. Um, and they help you with the analytics on the POS. And that takes a look at your inventory. Any, any last minute questions, feel free to drop in the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, I just want to remind you that Pacific Community Ventures is here to support you. Um, you have a we have a dedicated team of relationship managers here for you. Um, and um, again, I'll share out these slides so you'll have all of our contact information um, after the fact as well. Um, we also, um, have just some additional resources that Trevor um, is providing um, use, that he used to create this presentation. And again, I'll be sharing out the slides so you'll get all of these links um, if, there are inform if there's areas that you wanna dive a little bit deeper into. We have, um, I'm also sharing out our webinar calendar link. Um, Pacific Community Ventures is trying to provide as many opportunities for learning um, through these webinars that we're hosting. And we're also co collecting and organizing webinar free webinar offerings from our partner organizations, all collected here in this one place. Um, so I'll share that link out um, later today as well. Um, any last minute questions? I don't see any more questions here. So I think we can wrap it up. I just wanna thank you, Trevor, so much for joining us, spending this time this afternoon with us um, and sharing your knowledge. Thank you to everybody on the phone for listening in, for sharing uh, your stories, for sharing your questions. Um, and uh, like I said, I'll follow up later today with, with the recordings um, and